Uh, the thing I'd like to do most of all is to play the piano, yeah. And why do you like to play the piano? Uh, is it to play uh, uh, good, good uh, with arpeggios nicely, is it, and good? The rumba. The rumba. One, two, three, four. <laughs> Derek Paravicini is completely blind and severely learning impaired. I'm going to do Flight of the Bumblebee by Rimsky Korsikov. Flight of the Bumblebee. He also displays many of the signs of autism. Yet his brain is a perfectly programmed musical computer. What does it mean to be a musical genius in the wake of such a profound disability? Christine Carey, how are you? Derek is 26. He doesn't know his left from right and can barely count to 10. Like many people who cannot see, Derek has developed an acute sense of hearing. Most of us, without knowing it, filter the noise around us to make sense of our environment. But Derek seems to have no filter at all. Where are we now? And for him, the world is a very confusing place. But it has allowed him to flourish in ways most of us could never imagine. Uh, is that a G? The train's going in G, is it? It's in G. Right. As the train gathers pace, Derek is actually translating the changing pitch of the engine into precise musical notes. E, F, A, minor, minor. I'd like to play some Mozart in name. Today, Derek is travelling to Sheffield with his old friend and mentor, Dr. Adam Ockleford. Oh, enjoying this, thank you. It's a good day out, isn't it, Derek? A very good day out. Through Adam's painstaking efforts, Derek has transformed his extraordinary gift into a language all of his own. And today, he speaks it eloquently. He's got extraordinarily developed analytic hearing, which I don't know of any parallels for. We know very little about what's inside Derek's head, and actually Derek remains an enigma at heart. There are some pianists who can play a million notes a second, but it doesn't mean anything because it doesn't have any feeling, you know. Um, and there are other people who can play the simplest thing and just sort of get you there, you know. And Derek, I think, has the, importantly, has the ability to do both. Derek's talent is clear, but it raises questions. Where does genius like this come from? And how can it possibly coexist with such severe disabilities? Adam first met Derek 22 years ago when he was teaching music at a school for the blind. Mozart. Bit of Mozart. Yeah. 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 By Daniel Barenboim. I can play that, Adam. Yeah. He played that when he was eight. Yeah. Eggs. Come on, let's go the eggs. Eggs. Derek's problems began when he was born three and a half months prematurely. Mm. Where's the chicken's eggs? There aren't many children who survive being born that early and indeed his twin sister didn't uh, and Derek nearly didn't he only weighed one pound five ounces they really didn't expect him to survive he technically died three times while he was in the hospital and each time they were managed to bring him back to life again in order to keep him alive Derek's tiny lungs desperately needed oxygen but the hospital lacked the equipment to control the amounts given. As a result, the doses of oxygen that baby Derek received in these critical first weeks were too great and were the cause of his blindness. They didn't have the equipment. And we'll never know, of course, but perhaps if, if that facility had been available, he would not have had his 
retina destroyed by too much oxygen. But there was worse to come. The oxygen treatment that kept him alive also had a devastating effect on Derek's developing brain. We began to realize that he had more wrong with him than uh, just being blind. He has the severe learning disability, which would once have been called, I think, very retarded, and he has difficulty with logical thought. Seven, eight, seven. Eight, seven. His family had little hope that Derek would ever be able to communicate meaningfully until, at the age of two, something extraordinary happened. Nanny came in one day and said, would you like to come and listen to this? And this tiny child was playing a tune. Soon after this startling revelation, Derek was taken to a school for the blind. In the hall, there was a piano lesson going on. And Derek broke free and ran straight towards the piano as if he could see. Push the little girl who was having a piano lesson. I pushed her out of the way, <laughs> tried to take over. The piano teacher that day was Adam. So he just freed himself from uh, Nick and Mary Ellen and just started to play. He was using not only his fingers, but also the backs of his hands, karate chops, elbows for the far notes, and occasionally dip forward and use his nose as well. Since then, Adam has devoted thousands of hours to nurturing Derek's talent. And it wasn't long before Derek was acknowledged worldwide as a bona fide musical prodigy. He's making it up as he went along. Yeah. 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 At the University of Sheffield, Derek's memory for music is about to be challenged by some doubting music scholars. Derek has never heard this Basque lullaby before, but after just one hearing, how much of it will he be able to remember and repeat? Derek Paravicini remembers every one of the thousands of pieces of music he has ever heard. But he's never heard this tune. Okay, right then, find the pedal then. Derek's remarkable talent, combined with mental impairment, classifies him as that rarest of beings, a savant. Thank you. At Trinity College, Cambridge, Derek meets Professor Simon Baron Cohen, an expert on autism. A savant is usually defined as someone who has uh, at least one unusual skill that's out of keeping with all of their other skills and it's obviously most conspicuous in an individual who's got learning difficulties. People with autism tend to be very good at systemizing and music obviously lends itself to sequence and pattern which may be why people with autism uh, are attracted to music and sometimes that can really be developed to a high level and become savantism. For the last six years, Derek has lived in RNIB Redhill College for the Blind, outside London. Behind 
Where's the, where's the pickle, Kim? Got the pickle. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Left on his own, he would not know how to dress or feed himself. Brown or white bread, Derek? Uh, brown bread. Brown bread. Kim? Yes? Uh, is that the white bread, Kim? No brown bread. Would you like white? Yes, Kim. Uh, sure? Sure. Not one of each. One of each. Brown and white, <laughs> Kim. Is that the brown bread, Kim? It's white. Well, I have white today. Okay, the knife. Derek needs personal care around the clock. Yes, Kim. And probably always will. Let's get some butter. There you go. Sit side to side. Turn the bread round. Is that, is that the brown bread, isn't it, Kim? No, it's the white bread. There you go. I'm just going to chop some cheese for you. Um, is that was the brown cheese, Kim? It's red Leicester. Red Leicester. There you go. That's that. That's that. See if you've got any crisps. See if you've got any crisps, Kim. You have. Ready salted? Ready salted, please, Kim. His tendency to repeat what he hears is called echolalia. Derek still resorts to this when he doesn't fully understand what is being said. Show me how to do it, Kim. Brilliant. Thank you, Kim. Well done. Derek's brain is now almost exclusively dedicated to hearing, processing and creating music. This piano is linked to a computer which turns each note he plays into a different light signal. Derek possesses an extremely rare gift of universal absolute pitch, which means he is able to discriminate every note he hears, much as we recognize different colors. When areas of the brain are not being stimulated in the usual way, those areas of the brain are recruited for other functions. In Derek's case, auditory processing, tactile processing, compensating for the reduction in visual processing. If you have more neurons, then it ought to be possible to store more auditory information. The brain doesn't waste neurons, they're too precious. But not only can Derek clearly perceive every different note, but he can do this even when they are played simultaneously. E flat is something special to Derek, isn't it, Derek? Yeah. yeah. So for most people, all the notes sound similar. They sound a bit high or a bit low. But for you, Derek, they, every note on the piano is quite different. It is. OK, here's one note for you. Good. That's one note. Excellent. Now listen to that for two. Ready? Two. Yeah, when it gets to about three, I'm starting to lose track. Good. That That's was perfect. Five notes. Excellent. And here's six notes. Ready? OK. Just the six. That's six Fantastic. notes. Fantastic. Yeah. Good, 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 good. Most highly trained musicians wouldn't be able to do that. They could tell you what the bottom note and the top note was, and they might be able to work out what the middle ones should be. Derek seems to, to know. Fantastic. Well done, Derek. The thing with the chords on the piano is obviously I've only got ten fingers and Derek's only got ten fingers. So at the minute that's really as far as we can go in finding out just how many notes Derek can hear. But there may be one way to find out more. What if Derek were to hear dozens of notes all played at once? He is about to listen to a sequence of chords that he has never heard before, and this time played by a full orchestra. Fifty instruments are playing dozens of notes all at the same time. Almost incredibly, Derek is able to distill the essence of all he hears into what he plays. Extraordinary, really. I mean, these incredible flourishes all the time. I couldn't work it out until it suddenly struck me that, of course, the chords consisted of more than ten notes, i.e. more than ten fingers. 
and therefore he had to, in order to accommodate all the notes that he heard, he had to arpeggiate them going up and down like a harp rather than playing block chords, which is what we were doing. Really fascinating. You know, that he can't see this sort of large display of instruments and sounds and what the instruments look like. Um, it's, it's, it's amazing, yet he responds to all the different colours that are that an orchestra possesses, the sheen of the strings and the, the, the roundness of the brass tone. It's obviously a, a huge talent there which none of us can understand and uh, it was, I know it was a most rewarding experience. Derek's brain must be wired very differently from the rest of us. But can we begin to understand how? At the psychology department of Goldsmiths College in London, Professor Linda Pring has designed an experiment that will give us a window onto Derek's working brain. This EEG technique of monitoring brain waves is something that's been around for a long time, but only recently have we had the technological advance to really refine it. Right, I'm just going to measure your head. Linda believes that Derek's singular musical capacities are the neurological consequences of his specific combination of blindness, learning impairment and autism. So we fitted up Derek with 32 electrode positions all over his scalp so that they could monitor the electrical activations that emerge. Linda wants to find out how accurately and how fast Derek's brain is processing music. I'm going to press the button now and you'll hear the first piece. Ready? Yes, ready. So what we set up were 64 small musical phrases taken from the Moonlight Sonata. Uh, that was wrong. Was that wrong then? And in half of these, we inserted an error and asked Derek simply to tell us whether they were correct or not. Um, wrong. Wrong? How about that one? Uh, that ended in a right note, Angela. It soon becomes clear that Derek's verbal responses are unreliable. The most clear-cut thing we found, and it really was very exciting indeed, is that Derek's verbal responses were almost random. But when we looked at his brain waves, a very, very different story emerged. He was discriminating incredibly clearly. Each and every wrong note triggers a split-second response in Derek's brain. That was right. Wrong, Angela. Do you want to go with wrong on that? It had a funny yeah. note in it there. Did you hear that note? It was I did, like... Angela. Derek's brain processes musical data with total accuracy and enormous speed. And he does this with greater precision and focus than many professional musicians, despite his inability to communicate clearly with language. He's only interested in music, really. And he's not having to think about all the other pieces of information and the world that the rest of us are grappling with. So that clarity and focus of cognitive processing probably has played a, a significant role in the development of his talent. But if Derek has such difficulty communicating, can his musical dexterity truly be called talent? Is Derek really playing with feeling or does his playing lack emotion? The one area in which these savants tend to not be as expert as normal musicians is in their emotional palette. That very often the performances are in some sense emotionally stilted or lacking in any particular emotional communication. Professor John Sloboda, an expert on music and emotion, hopes to measure how well Derek can discern emotion within a piece of music. Play that piece again, but try and play it in a way that is really, really happy. Happy. Happy, yes. Yeah.
he did rather better than one might have expected. He really got some of the key features of Happy, which is a fairly high speed, fairly loud, a little bit staccato, and in a major key. Thank you, Dave. Okay. Now, change the mood completely. This time it's going to be very sad. And then for sad, he immediately took it to minor key. It's as though he knew that's the rule. Sad equals minor. One more time, and this time, angry. Really angry this time. But with angry, he really was completely stumped. He played it very, very similar to the happy, but you heard that he was kind of growling. So he knew that something else had to be provided, but actually he didn't have the musical capacity to put that into his playing. So Sophie is going to do exactly what you did. She's going to play a different piece, and she's going to play it three ways, happy, sad, or angry. And I'd like you to listen to each of those performances and tell me which emotion you think she's using in her playing. Okay. Derek, what do you think? Happy, sad, or angry? Uh, uh, sad. Well done. Sad. Thank you. He immediately wanted to seek reassurance, as so, though, have I got it right? Which, which meant to me that it wasn't coming from a deep place inside himself, but it's something he's beginning to approach. Perhaps it had been discussed, perhaps it had been talked. And he'd begun to get a sense that there is a code out there. There is a way of assigning a particular emotion to a particular situation. What about that one then, Derek? Uh, happy, sad or angry? Uh, happy. Fantastic. Well happy. Done. Well done. Derek is, is learning the code of emotional communication. Happy, sad or angry? Uh, angry. Perfect. Well done. Thank you. He's beginning to piece together what it is that someone will do or say or indicate if they are sad, happy, etc. And obviously the code is still incomplete. If you can Perhaps in the end, yeah. the only way to judge Derek's capacity for emotional musical expression yeah. is simply to listen to the music he creates. The idea when you're playing is whatever you're feeling, it's supposed to have that effect on the audience. Thank you, Derek, very much. And I think that's what Derek manages to achieve. In my experience, the best musicians are the ones that, pl when they play, it's an extension of themselves. And I think that's the great thing about Derek's playing. When he plays, it's, it's an extension of his personality and his feelings. At Red Hill, Derek is getting ready for a daunting journey. He's never before been far outside the UK, but now he's off to America. No, 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 you don't sit on the bed because your case is here. Let me show you. He's been booked to play Las Vegas in front of the biggest audience of his life. How many trousers do you think we're going to need? Uh, one trousers, Ooh. two, two trousers. Let's start with those. Now, do we need your widgie? Need that? Who is it? Need that? Who is it? I think we need some sunscreen. Sunscreen, yes, sunscreen. <clears throat> okay, can you find, put it in the bag, in the hole there? Up a bit, up high. <laughs> yeah, 
and guide your hand in, okay? In. Okay. All right. What about elephant? Put him there. There you go. Okay. That's it, I think, pretty much. That's it. Well done. Derek has difficulties coping with the world at ground level. So how will he fare for 12 hours at 30,000 feet? Derek is on his way to the airport and a flight to America where he will perform a duet that will open a high-profile concert. Adam has arranged a blind date. Derek's duet partner will be another musical savant, a boy he has never met. Derek is California bound, but how will he adapt to this new world? Rex Lewis Clack is 10. He lives with his mother, Kathleen, in Malibu, California. He is a gifted classical pianist and will duet with Derek at the upcoming concert. Like Derek, he is also blind and severely learning impaired. I guess his development first started really in his fourth year of life. He really didn't walk consistently till he was five. Five. For me, it's a time investment <laughs> I put in. We all invest in something, and I feel like this is the best investment, you know, that I, I've ma ever made. You know, emotional, monetary, and I think that now Rex continues, of course, to be a challenge. But for me, there was never a choice. I love my son, broke up my marriage, changed my life, because I was inspired by him, I was inspired by love, I was inspired by a maternal pull. Uh, I was scared. It was painful. Um, there, I had to deal with guilt and all sorts of feelings, but I, I never faltered a second. It's Monday morning in Malibu, and Derek is reflecting on his first transatlantic flight. What did the captain say? Uh, cabin crew ready for landing. Yeah. Fantastic. And what did you think of the turbulence? It was a bit bumpy. A bit bumpy. bumpy. A bit bumpy, bumpy. <laughs> the turbulence was a bit bumpy, wasn't it, Kim? Yeah, it was quite yes. bumpy, wasn't it? It was. But it was all right in the end. But it was all right it? in the end, yes. Fantastic, Derek. Good old Derek. Shall we go then? See Rex and Kathleen. Go. With Kim. With Kim. All right. Yeah. Ready? Ready. Okay. Fantastic. Shall we leave him there, Derek? Leave him there. Yeah. Leave him there. There we go. Okay. Yeah. I can count numbers, Adam, really. Can you? Which, yes. which numbers can you count? One. Yeah. Excellent. Now there's no time to lose in meeting his duet partner for the first time. Hi, Rex. Hi, sir. Derek. Hi, Rex. Hi, Hi. 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 Rex. Hi. Do you like flying? Or I do, Kathleen. Oh, good. Do I liked the bumpy part. You like the bumpy part, Derek? I did. <laughs> so you did, Derek. Made you cling on, didn't it? Um, Adam took me to the turbulence toilet, Kathleen. <laughs> the, <laughs> the turbulence toilet? You mean you went in the toilet and it was a, in a turbulent spot? Is that what it is? That's or? What, well, that's what it was, yes. Uh -huh. Excellent. Very good. good. Which way, Rex? Let's follow Rex's left. cane. Can you tap your cane, Rex? We'll follow it. With the performance less than a week away, Adam is anxious to find out if these two can do what they do best, together. What would you like to play first, Rex? Oh, I've got rhythm. I've got, I've got rhythm. rhythm. Yeah. Rhythm. In four days, Derek and Rex are expected on stage at the Mandalay Bay Resort in Las Vegas. It's nice to see you both. Adam and Derek. Thank you. <laughs> thanks, <laughs> thanks, Rex. Lovely to see you. Yeah. You want to play your I Got Rhythm? Yes. Yes.
Rex wasn't too keen on, on sharing the sort of space with, with Derek. When it's his piece, <laughs> it's a little bit more difficult for him to open up and let a, another musician play it in a different way. I think, obviously, Rex is, is still quite little. Derek, in a way, because he's done so many concerts, I think is fairly bomb-proof. He'll, he'll, I know he'll come up with, with what he's asked to do. At the minute, I don't know Rex well enough to know whether he will or he won't, so that's the challenge over the next few days. Because obviously playing for 10,000 people, we've got to get it right. We can't stop and start and, and, and decide not to do something. Though Rex is classically trained, Adam decides to try a ragtime piece by Scott Joplin. Do you want to join in, Rex? Would that start? Uh, sure. Yeah, yeah. The thing for the concert is that they've got to come up with something self-contained that's convincing right from the start. Join in. Going, Rex? Going. Right, I've got the three pianos. For Rex, it's sort of like the introduction of creative variations. It opens up his brain slowly, and then all of a sudden he's listening to the other music, but it's not like it's infringing on what he's doing. It's not threatening to him, I guess. You know, how can you not love playing with Derek? <laughs> I think this is going to be great for Rex, just uh, he loves new inputs. Adam and Derek. Fantastic Rex. Yeah. <laughs> it's time out, and Rex wants to introduce Derek to some other musical savants at his teacher David Pinto's house. Pinto believes these remarkable young musicians possess an intuitive bond with the world of music. I have composed concertos that I wish I could remember when I woke up. I played jazz solos that were outlandishly wonderful, but the moment I wake up, the wisp of that imagination disappears. It's not strong enough, it's like smoke, to withstand this physical world, but they're in touch with it. It doesn't blow away, it's just there. that a two-year-old kid can all of a sudden full bloom come in and start doing melodies. Even though it's hard to believe, I think music is an inherent part of the universe. So, in Derek, has Pinto met a super savant? Some of his solos are outlandishly good. They're right at the top in terms of improvisational skills. He's so creative. I am just so in love with the joy that he brings to his playing. But, you know, it's really interesting. We don't know the limitations of his mind. Away from his beloved piano, Derek soon retreats into his inner world. 
He is being driven to the last rehearsal with Rex before they both leave for Las Vegas. Right, Rex, someone's going to say, and now Rex. Rex and Derek are going to play the entertainer. Rex. Adam knows all too well that as he struggles to rehearse these musicians in Las Vegas, preparations for their public performance are already underway. Although Rex is having problems, Kathleen will never forget just how far he's already come. He wasn't interested in doing anything. He was apathetic. He was touch averse. He wouldn't touch or hold anything. Imagine a blind child. He couldn't listen to any sounds. I mean, light switches, doors closing, water running. It all made him flip out. I mean, it was like I was a hostage. He's come a long way in two years, but what he wants to play, he can't yet play. <laughs> the thing with performing, it's, it's not about enjoying music, it's not about communicating. At the end of the day, it's doing a job, really. That's the first thing to get right. You've got to come up with the goods when someone asks you and, and do it well, and all the rest is a plus. So it's really Will Rex and Derek pull it off together that's the big worry at the moment because they're, at the minute, they're not really playing together very well. I think the other thing is that lots of people are trying to help at the minute. Um, his mum and his teacher all have lots of ideas, but I think it's probably overloading Rex with, with too, much, too much information. So he's, he's finding it quite challenging, I think. Las Vegas, the home of the shows. and two young entertainers have just arrived in town to make their debut. Time is running out, and it's clear that Adam still has a problem. The entertainer. Yeah. And there'll be drums, there'll be lead guitar, bass um, guitar, keyboard, yeah. and you and Derek. Yes. Yeah. All playing together. It is a lot for him at times. Um, it is overwhelming. I'm sure he'll, you know, once he's at his piano and once he hears the clapping, then it's fun for him and <laughs> he's a showman. <laughs> at the event center, the boys are introduced to the stage and a host of strange new sounds. Like it! Woo! Great, isn't it? While Derek is reveling in everything he hears, even Kathleen is now growing anxious about Rex as he struggles to cope with the noise. But in four hours, the show must begin. Back in the, back in the USSR. Back in the, back in the... Jackets? Yep. Gala tickets for this evening's show cost $2,000. And it's a sellout. They're all right, Kim. How does that feel? Feels all right. You're very smart. I do. Rex Lewis Clark. And <laughs> Kathleen, my mom. L-E-W-I-S hyphen C-L-A-C-K. While Rex and Kathleen enjoy the red carpet treatment, Derek is off to the casino, as he, at least, is feeling lucky. Six, come on! Tonight's show is in support of the Lily Clare Foundation and its resource center for the families of children with neurogenetic disorders. This evening, Mr. Jason Alexander. As television's Jason Alexander introduces the boys, so please, ladies and gentlemen, put your hand there's nothing more that Adam and Kathleen can do but hope.
Saturday night in Las Vegas, and it's showtime. Right, Rex, start. Wait there. All right, Rex. All right. Go on then. Rex jumps a section, but keeps going like a pro. Derek, too, takes it in his stride, and the show goes on. Rex, too, is holding his own, and now he's playing with Derek and the band. did the job. That's, that's the main thing. The important thing is to play what you're supposed to play, when you're supposed to play it. And if you have that kind of flash of inspiration, that's great as well. But the important thing at this stage is to, is to perform the right piece at the right time and uh, behave appropriately, and that's what they did. I loved your improvising. You did that like my improvising. Great job. Let's you give Derek a big performance. Let's have a group hug, group hug, group hug. Hang on. It's been a great learning experience. I can see Rex listening to Derek. I know he's gotten all those jazz influences, and I, I think I'm going to be hearing them for, for weeks, and I think it's going to spark a new, a new wave in Rex. I think he's going to want more and more of that. You know, Derek is something to aspire to technically and just in life. I'm very inspired by Derek, both musically and developmentally. He's, he's awesome. Way more, more. Way more, more, Derek. Yeah, yeah, I'd love to do that again. Fantastic. Right, so what's going to happen today then? Mr. Paravicini. I can tell you what we're doing tomorrow, Adam. Yep, what we do. We are going, going I'm back to England. Fantastic. Back to England for Lambourne. On a short flight, up yeah. and down, up, up and, and down, down, up and down, down with you and Kim. And then what? And um, get off. Yeah. Oh. Ah. Fantastic. Derek will soon be heading home, but his future yeah. remains as uncertain as ever. What does the future hold for Derek? In music, it's pretty cruel. The first thing you have to do is to love the music and be rather good at it, so he's got that. I think the future for Derek is in particular niches where he's really, really good, really special and really unique. Sort of early jazz, really. That first 20, 30 years of the 20th century, Derek is just, he's, he's at home there. One of the reasons that he's influenced and inspired by jazz people and likes playing jazz music is the fact that you improvise in it, and um, which allows him to go off wherever he wants, which I think is important. You know, it's fantastic to play a classical piano piece. Well, that's a marvellous thing to do, but it can be restricting if your mind works in a slightly different way to that. People compare Derek to Art Tatum, the great blind uh, jazz pianist from the early 20th century. When you listen to Art Tatum, there are some sort of similarities, I think. Probably Art Tatum and Derek have a certain sort of spiritual affinity, almost. They, the way they approach their music is the same sound world. Derek's left hand is very strong and um, plays an accompaniment all by itself, like that.
very good about Derek, of course, is that um, occasionally when I've I've sat down and played duets with him. You don't really have to explain anything, and I think that's the great thing about a really good musician is that, you know, you don't really have to. He just has very, very good ears, so you can play something like that, and he'll immediately sort of pick up on whatever the next thing is. You know, he just is straight in with whatever the, with his ears, with whatever you know, is going on at the time, which is the most important thing, you know, with music to be able to hear what's going on.